edition of the Taisig Talks, which are a co-production of Tilt University and Mind Labs. We are broadcasting live again this afternoon from the Defray building in the vibrant and lively score zone. Our team of today consists of my co-host Marie Postma and our technical colleagues Maarten and Russe. We are uh, very proud to be hosting two speakers today. Our two speakers of today are Javad and Stefan, and Marie will introduce them properly in a bit. Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Javad is a PhD candidate and lecturer in the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence at Tilburg University. In his research, he is solving problems in neural-based machine translation, and these problems are due to data scarcity. For example, providing additional data for domain-specific systems or for low-resource languages, such as Persian. Before coming to Tilburg, Javad was a member of the NLP group at the University of Guilang in Iran. Among the topics of his expertise and interests are, besides machine translation, also sentiment analysis and unsupervised language acquisition. There are other interests that he pursues in his free time. Javad is an avid runner. He follows the performance of the Iranian soccer team on their way to the World Cup. And he likes coffee, particularly Irish coffee. Javad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much for it. Uh, before starting, uh, I'd like to thank the, the Twice Attack organizer for having me. Also, thanks to the people in the Zoom meeting for attending. Well, I want to start to introduce myself. My name is Javan Mustafa, and uh, with respect to the educational background, I did my undergraduate and postgraduate in my home country, Iran, uh, where I studied uh, computer engineering. During a master degree, I was also affiliated with the Iran National Processing, as Mari said. and. Uh, as for master thesis, I designed a sample analysis framework in Persian using the world network. It's called Deep Sample Version. Interestingly, same time last year, I moved to the Netherlands and I started my PhD at the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence at Tilburg University. I'm working with Dr. Dimitar Shatrinov and Dr. Peter Swan. Like many of my colleagues at the department, I'm broadly interested in AI and more specifically, I'm interested in different topics of machine translation, among other. I would say my primary research interests are human adaptation, data selection, and supervised neural machine translation or human. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our recent papers titled Selecting Public Internet Sentences for Neural Machine Translation or NLP using my lingual text. Before delving into the paper in detail, I'd like to br briefly explain to you why and where we use machine translation. So, if I want to break down the major tasks of machine translation, the first one would be assimilation. In a simulation task, I, as a reader, initiate the translation, and only I want to know the content of the input data. So, at this stage, I'm fully aware that the translation quality cannot be perfect. Uh, let me give an example here. As far as I'm concerned, Bold.com only supports two different languages, Dutch and Dutch. And whenever that I want to buy something, I go on the website and I turn on my machine translation API and I get the translation of the whole page. At this stage, I don't care about uh, the translation quality in terms of fluency. Um, but correctness is very important. Uh, it's not worthy that uh, a lot of research has gone in this direction, and also my research falls into in this direction. Uh, Okay, the next task is communication. Uh, let's say you are going to a uh, foreign country and then you cannot speak a local language, then you can rely on the translation. The communication task, uh, the good thing uh, is whenever that something is not clear and whenever uh, that you cannot understand the dialect, you can ask some follow up question. And 
what a simulation leader translation probably cannot be perfect. But the good thing is that we can have machine translation units uh, in different ap applications. We can embed them with uh, chat rooms. And also, we have this option to have them on our handheld devices. Uh, machine translation and communication are often combined and bonded with a speech recognition unit so that we have our input audio converted to the, converted to the input text, and input text uh, is fed to the uh, fed to the machine translation. And once we get the translated text, we can return it to the speech recognition unit. The last task would be dissemination. Uh, let's say um, I write a book and then I want to publish it in different languages. Here, in contrast to simulation and communication, translation community is very important. So this is the reason that this task is done by human translator rather than machine translation. But we can use the help of machine translation. Uh, so in this scenario, first we uh, translate uh, our input data using machine translation, and then the human translator can do the post data. Now we are somewhat familiar with the uh, uh, major task of machine translation. The next step is we want to create a uh, machine translation unit. So to train a uh, machine translation unit, we have two different uh, machine translation paradigms. The first one is a statistical machine translation, uh, which benefits from a statistical model. And the second one, neural machine translation, which benefits from deep neural networks. I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about the latter. Let's say the ultimate goal is translating from English to Dutch. Like any machine learning task, we would need training samples. But in a supervised setting, for a training element model, we would need file data. And a file of data is nothing but uh, a training sample that consists of source sentence and target sentence. So for each source sentence, we need the corresponding target sentence. And uh, for training an empty model, we have to follow some steps. The first step is generating input data. So as you can see in one of the slide, we have uh, our source sentence. It's followed by the start token, and then we have our target sentence. <coughs> the next step is that we have to vectorize the uh, input data. For vectorization, we have to use source embedding better and target embedding better. The next step is we have to feed our source embedding better. Okay. Target embedding vectors, uh, target embedding vectors to the sequence to sequence model. As you can see in the figure, in the left side we have encoder and the right side we have encoder. For the encoder, we don't need to calculate any output probability. This is the reason they have been blocked. But for the decoder, we need to calculate the output probability. And I put some random numbers there. Uh, but this number shows the probability of your tokens in the vocabulary list. Once we calculate the uh, loss of our deep neural network, then we have to backpropagate the uh, entire of our neural network in order to obtain the weights and biases of deep neural network. We have to uh, we have to do step two and step three uh, until the model is converted to the neural network. So now. Um, I'm going to use the underlying concept that I described in training to, to define the research problem. There is a common belief among machine translation of practitioner and researcher that more training data is better, which is correct. However, training an NMT model on large data sets requires substantial amount of resources, such as memory and time. Let me give an example. Let's say you're dealing with 31 million sentences. And all of these 31 million sentences, according to the previous slide, should be converted to the embedding vectors. And you can imagine that this embedding vector should be given to the memory. And uh, this embedding vector in our example uh, has 31 million rows and x dimension. And usually people don't choose a small number for x because it represents the dimension of your vectors, and we're not going to choose a small number because we don't want to lose the information. And even if we could solve the memory issue, it's still, according to the previous slide, we need to spend time for uh, training the model, updating devices, and data the model. So it's very uh, time, time consuming. Now, uh, there is another problem. Do we have file data for full language first? Let's say we want to create a model that can translate 
much preferred. So in low resource scenarios, we don't have parallel data. And even at worst, when it comes to translating different domains of interest, such as medical context, legal context, and even public I think it was two or three years ago that COVID hit all aspects of human life. So at that time, it was very important to finally accurately recruit communicate and share uh, medical information across the board in multiple languages. But the question is that, could you do that instantly? If you don't have part data for different domain of interest, such as COVID, data-driven empty paradigm, such as MMT, may perform poorly for dominant specific translation. It doesn't matter how many sentences we have, how many part data we have, you cannot get a good result uh, from training of model. So here, uh, we face with a two-side challenge. We need to define high quality indomit data. We have to say what amount of pilot ID or indomit data are necessary to achieve the state of the state of the art machine translation quality, and that should happen at low computational data capacities. Uh, so to be honest, the recent community has made many efforts through a technique which is called domain adaptation. In domain adaptation, there is an existing model, and people tend to point to it to a certain domain. But, but the point here is that the certain domain uh, should be different from what the model was originally trained for. Let's say uh, you're out of domain for this, and then you want to find it for the medical context. It was a good motivation for us to propose a method, a data selection method, in order to improve in domain translation in your resources scenario, as I said, for example, Persian to Dutch. Uh, and how we are going to do this. We are going to extract indomain sentences from out of the part of the process, and ultimately we want to include the selected or generated sentence in the context of permanent rotation for training and one. Briefly, our main contribution is proposing a language agnostic data selection method for selecting or generating a quality ID process. And I want to draw your attention to this sentence. We do this only using monolingual domain specific purpose. In other words, everybody can design a web folder and then they can go to Twitter, but they have to make sure that they are collecting uh, their intended domain. And using that uh, collected data, they can uh, generate part of the data that can be ultimately used for training and an NMT or SMP. And as I said, we don't need to translate anything, you don't need to uh, align any of uh, your sentences, and you can create a parallel in the main data set. So here you can see an overview of proposed methodology. On the left side of the slide, we have our out, out of the main data set, which has 31 million sentences, and we have also in the main data set. And as you can see, in the domain data set, you can have either source or target. So it's not a bilingual data set. The next step is we have to feed our sentences to, to the pre trained model, which we use uh, sentence first. There are many good reasons for choosing sentence first, but it's beyond the scope of this discussion. Uh, the next step, once we get the embedding vector, we have to feed them to the data selection algorithm. And data selection algorithm gives us not only one, but also any new in domain data set. And as you can see, this new in domain data set consists of source and target set, meaning that we can use it to deploy it for training and team. Like the number of in near in domain data set, we can use it to train one to n uh, entity models. In this slide, you can see uh, one iteration of our data selection algorithm. In a step one, because this embedding vector were given uh, by sentence word, and now we have embedding vector for indirect sentences, and also we have embedding vector for out of domain sentences. But what we do, we use the precise similarity to complete the similarity between the embedding vectors. And as I said, it's only one iteration of our data selection algorithm. Once we get the similar data store, you can see that the last block. We need to, in a step two, we need to sort them. Uh, in that way, we have the high similarity in top of the list and the low similarity at the bottom of the list. And at the end, we need to select top and new uh, in the main sentences. And in our case study, it was six. So it's very difficult to deterministically 
uh, select sinks. So it, it varies from data set to data set. Here also you can see an example of a data set that you have this. In this, table, in this table, as you can see in the rightmost column, we have the store or a similar disk or out of 100. And the first row, we have our query or monolingual information. It can be very complicated in the ocean. And as you can see, we don't have similar data store because we use that to find the relevant genome synthesis. And then in the next row, we have top one following genome synthesis. I forgot to tell you that we uh, conducted this experiment with English to French data set. This is the reason that you can see English and French as a result. So for top one, for example, the single real story is 90.10. For top two, we have 86.60. For top three, we have 85.96. And as we are going to the larger uh, N, the single real score is decreasing. So if I want to uh, tell you that what we showed, we showed even though NMT models employ enormous part of data, they could not perform very well for in-domain translation. As a result, more training data is not always sufficient for in-domain translation. We also try to mix uh, in-domain sentences with Calibre. So after creating our in-domain data set, we mix it with Calibre data, then we train the model from the scratch. Uh, the model improved, but it was not very significant. It's very clear because the model was biased toward the out of the name sentences or out of the name data set. Uh, we also compare our work with the state of the art method in terms of translation quality and uh, our work outperformed all of that. Uh, so, there is another important part here that our generated in domain sentences were relatively small. And according to the training penalty that we discussed, it resulted in less training time. Uh, so if I want to wrap up the research, I would say we propose a method to help initial translation committee to mitigate the lack of target in the network. And as I said, uh, it's a language agnostic technique, so it can be used for any language pairs. So the selected data can be applied directly to one of the special English translation. So once we created our sentences, then they, we can employ them for the uh, training and model. And the proposed selection pipeline comprises of contextual sentence embedding and a semantic search. Why well, I call it semantic search because we have a query, it's like a search engine, and then once we get the query, then we go uh, to our out of domain sentences and find the relevant data. And uh, in the last part, we have a ranking in domain data. We have the sorting algorithm that sort our sentences. And for the future work, we, we tend to uh, use generated profile in the context of domain adaptation, or even we can use it in the multiple versus. Uh, in case uh, in case you are interested in reading the full paper, because uh, we investigated this research from different angles, you can scan this QR and uh, access to the paper. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. If you want to have any question, I will be happy to take it. Thank you, Jamak, for this uh, presentation about your research. I have one question. Uh, the general question about translation quality. You mentioned that you evaluated uh, your system and that it performed better than state of the art. Can you say something about the evaluation? How are translation systems evaluated and how does that pertain to our perception of senior users? Yeah. So, what we usually do is that we have gold the standard or gold reference that uh, is usually created by the human translator. And next, we have some metrics such as uh, view. And what we do, we compare the board based on your n grams with the gold standard reference, and then we publish a score, like F1 score in machine learning, or like we have accuracy. It's a kind of a metric that we have. So it's based on the n gram. And for example, we go and check the first board, the first board of the human translation, and then we go to the second board, and then we compare the two different boards with the two different boards in the reference, and then we trade the trade this is the one technique that we commonly use in order to evaluate the machine translation performance. Okay, this is something about how that pertains to what we as human users would consider to be acceptable quality or good quality translation. Oh, uh, it's it's very controversial. I mean, uh, we, we, I mean, we can have one sentence and that can be translated in different ways. So. 
Uh, we usually, what we usually do is that we have the reference and then we can do our work at the end of the day with the reference. And uh, we also, we can consider the fluency and also adequacy, but most of the time, as I said, it's more related to assimilation. So we pay attention to the uh, accuracy rather than fluency. So if something goes wrong uh, in order to in order the in, in the order or in the format of the text, we don't really care about this. Unless we want to have, like, for example, uh, do some dissemination, like publishing the book in different languages.